Great. Well, good morning, everyone. As we have a few more people join us, um, I'd just like to share real quick, if you don't mind throwing in the chat box, maybe your name, what your role is, um, if you serve in a district, if you're a community partner, if you're a family member, that would be really helpful for me just as we go out through throughout the presentation today and I can kind of help um, guide our conversation to meet the needs um, of the people that are with us today. And I would just like to formally welcome everyone to the Ohio Statewide Family Engagement Leadership Summit. We are so glad you could join us on this day of professional learning meant to take family, school, community partnerships to the next level. My name is Patrick Cunningham and I'll be the session's moderator. Uh, this is session five, Family Engagement and Early Literacy, Leveraging Ohio's Rubric for School Teams. If you have any questions, concerns, or technical issues, please feel free to message me privately in the chat. Um, and to ensure that all get the most out of today, we're asking all the participants to turn off their cameras and microphones. Um, if you have any questions for the presenter, feel free to just um, use the chat feature and I'll pass along an, uh, questions at an appropriate time. Um, you can also join the conversation on Twitter. So be sure to use the hashtag um, chart new territories. And I'll put that in the chat as well um, so that you can share your thoughts there. Our presenter for this session is Jen Griffin, who is a regional early literacy specialist for State Support Team 9. And so we'd just like to welcome Jen. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so thankful that you've all taken time out of your busy life to be here with us today. Um, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to kind of just take some bridge to practice um, from what we've talked about from Dr. Gorski's presentation and just talk about some experiences that I've um, had as I've partnered with um, districts and community programs and families um, really across the state um, as this work has unfolded. So we're really excited about that. So again, thank you for being here today. Um, I just want to up front say um, I'm a very informal kind of person and our, our cameras are all off so if you need to take this opportunity to kind of stand up and stretch move around um, I'm a primary teacher by nature so it's, it's difficult for me to kind of even sit here and engage so I just want to say straight up um, the nature of this presentation today will be formal if you have a question please use the chat um, we will make sure that we address that but really your role here today is just to be um, I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I want to be very proactive in saying I'm not going to be launching polls um, or ask you to answer questions or do any cold calling like that. I just really wanted us to have an opportunity to um, have this conversation together. So I've done similar presentations like this in big groups of people, and I've done it with small groups of buildings and teacher-based teams. Um, and honestly, I've worked with my um, instructional coaches sitting at Starbucks having the same kind of conversation. So um, my heart is that um, we're able to connect things that we're all really passionate about. Um, and in my case, that's family engagement and early literacy. So um, my background, as I mentioned earlier, is um, I'm a primary teacher by training. Um, so I taught primarily when I was in the classroom kindergarten and first grade, but have some Title I experience as well. Um, and then I was home with my own children for a few years. Um, and in that time, um, really kind of developed my heart for other parents and families and our community partners. So I'm just really excited about um, how our state is moving in the direction of realizing that um, we can leverage all of the strengths that we all have to contribute to our children's language and literacy um, growth. Um, and supporting the whole child really does um, include supporting the whole family and the whole community as well. So again, I just wanna welcome you to the session today. And I want to proactively again, share that um, some of the materials I'm gonna be sharing with you today um, were developed by a work group team. Um, and so as I worked with my other state support um, team colleagues, um, we have the um, very solid um, family and community engagement network that is supported by the Ohio Statewide Family Engagement Center. Um, and so I, my um, colleague Heidi, um, name is on the slide as well because she has had tremendous impact on how this work has moved forward. And um, as we both worked with supporting our district um, building and our teacher-based teams, we just realized, again, there are a lot of great evidence-based practices in family engagement, and we have evidence-based practices in language and literacy, and how do we really combine those two to make them meaningful for teachers and families? 
So you can go ahead and adv advance there for me, Patrick. So today when we're together, we just wanna really explore some natural connections between family engagement and early literacy. I'm gonna help you to locate and engage with some resources to support evidence-based practices. And then finally, I just wanna give you a little time to think through what a next step might be for you as you nurture the relationship between family engagement and early literacy in your sphere of influence, because we all have an opportunity to make an impact. Um, you know, if we work in a library, if we work with parents and families, um, I'm very passionate about if you are a driver on public transportation, there are great things you can do in um, engaging children and families in conversation that we know are really instrumental and make a huge impact. So it's all about accessibility. So as I mentioned, evidence-based practices, and some of you might be involved in the National Network for Partnership Schools work with um, with Joyce Epstein. And so I wanted to talk real briefly about um, Epstein's six key areas um, for really engaging families. And I would also add community partners well. And when we're thinking specifically of language and literacy, the resources I'm gonna share with you are really um, developed around these six key areas. So the first is understanding families. And I think Dr. Gorski set us up beautifully for a conversation around that today. Um, the next is communication, volunteering, learning at home, decision making, and community collaboration. So I want you to keep these areas in mind as we add the language and literacy lens over top of that today. Okay, Patrick. All right, so all of this is really rooted as well, not just on those six keys of Epstein, but in Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement, which you'll find linked here. And I kind of always carry this paper copy around with me so you can print it off really beautifully and kind of um, have it with you with um, when you're working with your partners. Um, but there are five theories of action in Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement that we know um, are critical foundations for, again, not just our districts, but our um, community partners and families as we work together to support children. So the first is shared leadership. The second is multi-tiered systems of support. The third is educator capacity. And finally, we have family engagement. And you'll see I wrote and community collaboration. We have those in one box because we are really finding tremendous success in really, um, as we work through the shared leadership, multi-tiered systems of support and educator capacity, continuing to ask, um, what does this mean for our um, families? And then the next natural question really becomes, how do we engage our community to provide that additional um, layer of support? So I encourage you to check out Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement if you've not done so already. So as a result of these conversations, um, a work group came together in the state of Ohio to create the family engagement in early literacy rubric. So what we've done is taken Epstein's six keys that we know are going to make us really, really effective in engaging with families. And then really, again, looking at those evidence-based practices and coming up with a system and a tool that the teams can use as they work together to kind of assess their progress and where they are. So I'm going to kind of walk you through this tool today. And honestly, I just want to help you bridge some connections to the work that you're already doing. Because we know um, that we all are on initiative overload, <laughs> and then we take what's happening in life right now and we add it on and it just kind of feels like the pile keeps growing and everything's getting deeper. And so that really the purpose of this tool was just to help you see some natural connections to the work that you're already doing. So go ahead forward, please. All right, so I'm not gonna walk you through every key, but I'm just gonna kind of zoom in on some areas um, that we have found to be the most popular kind of um, starting places and entry points for the teams that we have worked with. Um, so as you would embark on this rubric and guide, um, what you have access to through the Statewide Family Engagement Center website is not just the rubric, which we'll show some levels here in a minute, but there's also a narrated slideshow that's available for you. So you don't have to be an expert in family engagement or an expert in literacy to utilize these resources. That was really our heart that anybody could take it and use it. So members of our work group have actually kind of narrated a slideshow that walks you through this rubric. And we actually say, 
pause this video now and talk to your team. And we kind of give you those um, coaching questions as we go. So I just kind of want to share that with you proactively that you do not have to be an expert to use this tool. Um, we've really done our best to just provide a resource that's helpful in guiding the conversations that happen with your colleagues and with your partners. Okay, so you can move forward, Patrick. All right, so we're going to take a little closer look at what this rubric looks like. So as you can see, it's a typical rubric, and there are four levels that you would use to assess your team. And we truly wanted um, to show you what the ideal would look like. And I know as we were working through it, we kind of were working through when we got to that level four, we thought, wow, this kind of feels like a Disney approach. Like, wow, if we can ever get there, um, this would be amazing. But what we found was it really led to some great conversation and especially people who have worked with um, grant, grant work maybe who've gone really in depth around the science of reading. Um, they were really able to take some bullets and components and really make that kind of the foundation of their work for the year. Um, and the beautiful thing is when you're talking about an area like communication, you can apply it to the science of reading and the literacy work that you're doing, but you also can take that same concept and apply it to the way you engage with families around PBIS or social emotional learning. Um, a lot of our teams have taken um, this approach thinking about communication and they have applied it to whatever evidence-based practice they're prioritizing based on their building data. So um, I will give you some of those examples as we go, because again, my, my role today really is just that we have a conversation about how to connect our work together. Okay, so we're going to do just a quick zoom in on, say, level three here. So what you would do um, is move through this rubric with your team. And again, it covers all six areas. And really, you're just looking at a conversation around how would we rate our efforts this year at communicating with our students' families? What would we need to do to improve? And then what, you're, what you would do is we have an examples and resource document that, that goes with each area of the rubric that can kind of give you some tools and resources that help you determine as a team what next steps you would take. So for example, if you're looking at this communication rubric, you might pull out level three. And you might say, which I'm gonna kind of read to you, I'm not sure how well you're able to see it right now, but there are multiple means for two-way communication with families at each grade level. So as I read that question, I'm sure that some of you in this audience are starting to think about the RTFI, which is the Reading Tiered Fidelity Inventory. And I know a lot of us have experience with this tool. Um, and so we kind of wanted to mirror that experience so that teams really do have some conversation points. So we might go through this and say, and you know, we have several people around the table and say, yeah, I think we did a really good job of doing that. And so our role, again, is not necessarily to be the expert, but a lot of times we're really kind of questioning one another of, do we really have evidence that we do that? We may have a lot of evidence that we're making intentional efforts to communicate with our families, but are we allowing for true two-way communication? Um, so as you can go down through there, I want to share one little point that I know um, has been really valuable in um, thinking about accessibility for um, all families and all learners, which is um, building staff consult the results of um, the language usage survey. Um, so that is something that's really um, been a great point, um, great starting point of work for a lot of our um, teacher-based teams and our families. And then finally, just school-wide reading plans. Um, do our families know that we have school-wide reading plans and um, how we really um, partner um, as teacher-based teams and as building teams to look at what we know the needs of our students are and how do we invite our families to be partners in the process because we know that they are so, so very critical. Okay, go ahead, Patrick. All right, so what you will see in this rubric that we have for you are just some example practices. So the way we tried to break it down was there are some things for administrators to consider, and then there are some, some things for educators to consider. And even if you are not um, in a school building, I really want you to think of how this applies to your role because we all are communicating with families and partners every day. Um, 
And so what we communicate and how we communicate and the ways that we can encourage, equip, and empower those around us to have a role in supporting not just children, but their families is really important to consider. So if you are administ an administrator and your team chooses to focus on communication, you might think about school staff at each grade level receiving professional development on providing multiple means for two-way communication with families. And I think we can all relate to this right now. I have, um, I have a sixth grader and a seventh grader right now. So I am shifting out of that um, elementary early childhood communication into um, junior high communication, which has been quite a shift and quite a learning experience for me. Um, but really, what are those two-way communication strategies and how did them, what do they look like? Um, for example, again, if you're an administrator, you might want to think about how you have family representatives on your school team to really help the school review and, and improve upon current communication protocols so that you reach all families. I think sometimes we have great ideas and we put a lot of things out there, but do we truly take that next step to get that feedback onto how that feels on the other side? Is it too much communication? Is it not enough? Um, what does our platform look like? You know, all of those things are great to get feedback on. And sometimes we're really good at surveys, but um, not just providing that, but those opportunities, again, for two-way communication and that open sharing and feedback face-to-face um, -face as much as we can from families. And finally, um, do we have established written protocols for communication from home to school and school to home for teachers and buildings? Um, remember that Brene Brown says clear is kind. And I think sometimes family engagement is an area that we just do, we do our absolute best, but sometimes it, um, let's, we don't always set clear expectations for everybody and hold people accountable for those things. So um, that's something for administrators to really think through. Um, again, on the educator side, um, are teachers communicating to families using a variety of methods and really communicating how they can support literacy at home in their everyday interactions with their child? So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, that's where I get really excited and passionate. So um, hopefully, hopefully we'll have lots of time to talk about that. And then finally, teachers use a variety of means of listening to families, gathering feedback about their child's educational experience and how they are experiencing learning at home. Um, this has taken a huge shift, obviously, um, in the last year and a half. Um, back to our English learners, I don't know if many of you have received the same feedback, but we are really working hard to consider um, how they experience learning at home. I don't know if any of you had this, but um, we had our um, teachers really engaging with young children who were learning English and we are, it melted our hearts to see and to hear um, their families engaging in those activities as they were also learning English. So we had siblings and parents, and even in one case, a grandparent um, that was learning along with the child. And oh my goodness, we realized we broke through a barrier and had access that we've never had access before. And so we were giving that opportunity, not just to children, um, but to their families as well. And so to, how do we capture that? and continue to honor those opportunities um, as we move forward and, th and things continue to shift. So that's a good thing you might wanna talk about as you're working through a rubric with a school team. You know, How are your families experiencing learning at home? And I think there are a lot of great takeaways um, that can really improve our practices moving forward. And then finally, teachers communicate regular, regularly with families about their child's progress at school and at home in ways that families can access. So again, there's that multiple means of accessibility, but also that regular communication is important. We are all so busy um, that, that families really, really appreciate that they know, you know, I have a menu of options for homework for this week, and I know, you know, I can do that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, or, oh, you know what, I have to check and sign something, but I only have to do it on Wednesday nights. Um, so establishing those rituals and routines it's not just important for young children, but it really is helpful for all of us. Okay. 
All right, so as you can see, again, I mentioned earlier with the rubric, we have some links to resources for you because again, we don't want people reinventing the wheel. Sometimes you really need to put your personal spin on it, but other times you just kind of need to see examples. And as teams work through this rubric, sometimes they work through and say, oh my goodness, we thought we were doing really well, but we're at a level two. And really what we want you to do is just identify one thing you can do to level up a current practice. We're not always asking everybody to do something new. Um, so as you can see here, um, this is just an example, um, but we have some sample end of the year progress. Um, letters. We um, have some apps that can help to promote that two-way communication. Um, we have some low-tech ideas because, again, really um, accessibility and FaceTime is becoming increasingly important. Um, there are a couple of new studies that I didn't get to include that um, is really talking about they are studying children that they take screen time away from for different periods of time and then are studying their body language and their ability to make eye contact and um, the ways that they're engaging and how long they're able to hold eye contact. So there's lots of things coming up, you know, that are really affirming that we need to continue to prioritize these low tech face-to-face um, -face engagements and interactions. So that's available for you as well with each area of the rubric. Okay. All right, so if you're working through this rubric with a school team, um, this is what you would do. We've included this for you as a summary page. And what you would really do is kind of go through each area and you would identify your successes and then opportunities for growth. We always wanna say, here's the things we do really well and how can we improve on that? And then as a district, you wanna look at how, how can you really systematize that? So it might be you have one building that does that really well and how does that really become the expectation for all the buildings? And furthermore, at the building level, you might have one grade level team that does that really well. So how do you consider really expanding that and ensuring that's the way you do business in every grade level? So again, as you and your team really review those examples and resources, you would decide what your next steps are and you could record them on page nine of the rubric. All right, so we've included in here, we're not going to watch this video today due to time, but um, one of my colleagues recorded um, a team from Plymouth Elementary. Um, they are a Comprehensive Literacy State Development Award winner. Um, and so they recorded just a short um, excerpt of their facilitation of the rubric. Um, so the protocol is typically for my friends who are um, consultants who work at, the, work at the ESC, or even if you're just a literacy coach in your building, that is you. We, we are so grateful for your partnership and we really wanna support you and be able to, um, to, to do this work with your teams. Um, so what you might do if you chose to facilitate this is send the rubric ahead of the meeting. Um, you might ask the school to gather just some resources that they share with families typically. Um, you would assign roles as you work through it, and then you would just really work on a voting protocol to talk about um, where you are. So you have a really fair assessment and you make sure that everyone's voices are heard. Um, some companion resources are listed there, and then there is a team um, with the roles included there. So you have access to go back and watch that if that would be helpful for you. Okay, so here are some examples. And I said, I'm pretty, if you haven't figured it out, I'm very much a connector, big picture brain kind of person. Um, so as our team worked through this, we kind of talked about what areas of the rubric might align to areas of work that teams are already being asked to do. So here are just some examples of places that if you're a coach or you are um, a community partner who works in a specific area, this might be really, really helpful for you. So if you are working through perhaps a letter to communicate the multi-tiered systems of support that are available, you really would want to focus on that communication section. That's really going to help you to make sure all of those evidence-based practices in language and literacy and family engagement are represented. Um, I would also encourage you again to consider your community partners and how they can provide additional layers of support, not just for children, but for their families as well. Um, you might be working on a cadence communication with families. Um, you might really want to share their child's progress and their benchmarking, and that might be a goal for your literacy team. If that's something you're working through, the rubric would really be helpful for you um, to look at in the areas of communication and in learning at home. 
Finally, if you're working on family literacy kits, which we know has been um, a big push over the last year and a half, we took a lot of our literacy nights that we were having and we turned those into virtual opportunities. Um, again, learning at home would be really valuable as well as communication. Um, it's a great way to kind of take that title one night that you're used to doing and really level that up to, again, universally design opportunities for families to engage. Um, the STAR reading program, um, sit together and read. Again, if that's a priority, um, you might want to look at the sections learning at home, understanding families, and communication. And then if you work with your community partners, and we, um, I was fortunate to be a part of a partnership where we had a really strong relationship with the foster grandparent program. And we also had a relationship with our pre-service teachers. So we kind of had both ends of the spectrum, but we really worked through that to say, if this is what our teachers, our educators are going through, how do we engage all of these people that we know are touching our children? So we had pre-service teachers that were consistently in our classrooms and we had foster grandparents who were consistently showing up in our building. So again, it's all about that equity piece of how do we provide that high quality language and literacy support to all of our adults who are reaching all of our students. And then finally, on that same note, after school programs and paraprofessionals um, have a great opportunity to impact our children. Again, they're very consistent. They're part of children's daily routines and structures. So if you're thinking about ways that you can embed them more deeply um, in the learning and the work of language and literacy, you might want to check out the community collaboration section of the rubric. Okay. All right, so again, I think we can move past this, but this is that layer of communication. So again, now that you kind of have a little broken down picture of what that looks like, this is a page in the rubric. And again, you would just choose, um, choose just one way to level up. That's what I would encourage you to do. Okay. Oh, look a little double here. I'm sorry, keep going there. Okay, here we go. And I'm gonna take you a little bit through the learning at home section. I think this is what we can connect to most because it really does align with the work that's happening. Um, again, in our library, um, in a kindergarten classroom, in our pre-kindergarten classroom, um, I'm really thankful that Ohio, um, our plan to raise literacy achievement is birth through grade 12. Um, we all know um, that um, the greatest amount of brain development's happening in that birth to three, and even, even say pre prenatal to three. Um, so I'm so excited about the opportunities that we have to truly partner with families and caregivers um, so they really can be empowered in the role that they play in the lives of their children. So learning at home is a place that I'm really passionate about, um, and I hope you find strong connections to your work. So Patrick, we'll show them a little bit what that looks like. Okay, so here you go. We did the same thing. And as you'll notice, there's more bullets as we get down into level three and level four. Um, we just want you to be able to find something to hold on to that aligns to your current plan. So it's structured much the same way. Um, so I will just read one thing from level three to give you an example. Um, so information about the importance of language and literacy development and evidence-based strategies for supporting language and literacy development ho at home is shared and modeled quarterly. So what we're saying is we really are trying to move past that one and done, let's talk about the third grade reading guarantee every fall type of meeting. Um, and we really just wanna talk about those proactive systems and supports that we can create. So if you'll notice when I read that statement, evidence-based strategies is in bold. So we really wanted to make an effort to make sure that those terms were well-defined. So as part of our rubric as well, you will see each of those um, bold terms defined later. Um, so we make sure that really everyone is in the same page because we know that clarity and consistency in language is really important. Okay. All right, so if we're talking about some example evidence-based practices, again, that really take those six keys to effective family engagement, and we talk about those effective evidence-based strategies in language and literacy, really administrators need to consider have school staff at each grade level received professional development on creating and encouraging learning at home experiences. Again, sometimes we have expectations that our teachers just know how to do this. 
Um, and we know just much like a lot of our language and literacy knowledge that this isn't something that we spend a lot of time on um, with our pre-service teachers. So I would encourage you again as an administrator to think about that support. Um, if you have um, any influence um, with pre-service teachers to think about how you can facilitate that. If you have, you know, student teaching is great. Um, we intentionally invited um, our student teachers to be part of our Partnerships for Literacy team, part of our TDTs. Um, and we really um, scaffolded them to, to know how to ask that question from the beginning as, of how does this impact our families and how can we invite them to partner with us if this is what our data is showing us as a priority. And then finally, thinking about those school teams again and how we get that family input to improve upon our practices so that families have meaningful and accessible opportunities to, port, to support their child's language and literacy growth at home. So educators, again, a variety of methods on how to support those practices. Are we really just demonstrating what it looks like? Are we doing events? Are we doing kind of workshops where, I mean, we just kind of talk about a strategy, but then we give people time to practice while they have us there to coach and support them. Um, are we communicating grade level standards, expectations, and recognizing families for their learning at home activities? That two-way communication part is what's really neat, and it's something that we haven't really had in the past, but we're seeing great success with not only families engaging other families, but our community partners having some kind of evidence of what we're doing that's going really well. So, um, STAR is a great example. If you have any um, experience with STAR at home, um, we had some barriers in the journal back and forth um, during, during a pandemic. Clearly, that wasn't something we really wanted to encourage, but we still wanted that two-way communication. So how do you put a prompt on social media that asks families to engage or share their experience with their child? Um, and really kind of elicit those family responses. So we found that we would have a family that would engage. And then that would, of course, have a, another family saying, oh, my neighbor can do that. I can do it, too. So we started to see that ripple effect of people posting. And then, honestly, we were trying to get those star books in the hands of our families. We couldn't afford to send every book home with every family. Um, so we were able to say to our community partners, hey, look, here's the evidence that this is really working well. What's happening in the classroom is also happening at home. And we would really appreciate it if, you know, if Down by the Pond was a book that you could really um, donate to, you know, all of the preschoolers in this building and make sure that they get to take it home. Um, and it was a really beautiful process because, you um, we knew we were doing evidence-based practices at home. We knew we were doing evidence-based practices at school. Um, and then our community partners were able to come alongside of us and children were able to own a book that they had fully experienced with their teacher where they had a great positive experience with it and then at home with their family. Um, and it was just a really beautiful picture of I feel like what Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement could be when we put all of these components together. Okay, go ahead. All right, here again, we have learning at home um, resources for you. So our really what we wanted to do was if you just again want to level up, we wanted to set this up. So if you want to go to one of these resources and you just as a team commit to saying, hey, you know what, let's every Monday we're going to share, we're going to share a tip. You know, every Monday we're going to we're going to do something that promotes family conversation. We're going to share a prompt for everybody to talk about at dinner and ask people to come on and um and, and share their responses. I've, I've encouraged a lot of my teams, especially I work a lot with elementary buildings to say, you know what, just share a literacy tip for families. Maybe the first week of the month, you share a preschool tip. Maybe the second week of the month, it's always for kindergarten families. Maybe the third week, it's first grade families. And this, you know, the fourth week, it's second grade families. And then you start all over again. So um, we're like everybody else. That system and structure is really helpful for us too. So again, this is all part of the rubric that you have access to through the Ohio Statewide Family Engagement Center. And then again, within this presentation. So we hope you check those out. Um, again, videos for families, literacy calendars. Um, we know that we don't, again, always have to reinvent the wheel. So we wanted to provide those um, resources for you. Okay. 
And again, if you were working through this with a team and you really want to collect that data and embed that in plans, um, you could use this summary page to talk about each key area, what your successes are and what those opportunities for growth are to prioritize your next steps moving forward. Okay. All right, again, if you walked through all areas of this rubric or just certain areas, we would encourage you to fill out and review the summary page. And then really, depending on what level you're working at, you would wanna make sure that you share this. A big part of continuous improvement is feedback loops. And we know how important that is, that teacher-based teams are communicating with their building leadership team. Building teams are communicating with their district team. And then, you know, again, that's, that's a continuous feedback cycle cycle up and down, but I really want to encourage you to think about how you're really intentionally involving your families and community partners in those feedback loops. Okay. All right, so you are all here because you coach in some way, shape, or form, no matter what role you play. And Atul Gawande says, coaching done well may be the most effective intervention designed for human performance. And the longer I'm in this role, the more passionate about this I become. So on the next few slides, I have some coaching points for you that just, again, might help you connect some of the resources we provide in this rubric to work you're already doing. Because... I'm going to be very honest and very transparent. I know that there's probably not very many of us in the position that are thinking, oh, I can't wait to take this rubric to this team and give them one more thing to do. Um, I know a lot of us aren't in that position right now. So really, I want to equip you as coaches and whatever role you play to kind of piecemeal and take what you need from these resources and align it to what you know people are already working on. So go ahead, Patrick. All right, so again, I'm just calling this kind of some facilitation scaffold. So if you work with partners at the district level, here are some things that you can do to connect this work together. If you are working with teams on their one needs assessment, we know that people are going to be identifying an improvement area of family engagement and community collaboration. And we know um, from the work we do every day, we know that the research says it's important. We know that the evidence is there. Um, so it's important that we really help people no matter what they're doing, even if it doesn't come out as an improvement area right away, that we start as coaches to ask those questions. So it doesn't feel like it's this additional one more thing, but we really are creating a culture that asks that question proactively rather than reactively. So what we really want to do here is focus on adult actions to support closing the gaps in literacy. And a lot of times we think of adult implementation based on those roles in a district, but really think about it as to what the evidence says has an impact on student growth. And again, Dr. Gorski shared this well, you know, it is not like the most important thing, but we know <laughs> We know how things change based on our anecdotal um, experiences when our families are truly engaged with us and when um, they have an understanding of what's happening in the classroom and the ways that they can support that. Next is if you're working on um, multi-tiered systems of support, which we often use the um, we often shorten to MTSS, um, so I want to be clear about that because I know we have a lot of different people in the audience today. And then local literacy plans, which are a priority in the state of Ohio. So how do we ensure that inclusion, voice, and engagement of all stakeholders are represented when we're talking about MTSS? What accessibility do we now have to improve the system for all students and adults? So again, I really, really want to encourage you um, to think outside of just talking about educators. We're talking about all adults within the school structure who impact children, and we're talking about outside of the school as well. And then another thing I'd like to challenge you to think about is are our supports designed around skill or are they designed around grade level? And I'm really proud of um, kind of the evolution and the update that happened in January 2020 with Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement. I think there were some language shifts in there that we talked about really um, the continuum of skill development rather than just age or grade level. So go ahead, please. All right, and Dr. Gorski talked about this, but I just wanna to touch on equity really quickly. Um, what might this process look like with family representation from each quadrant of the district? 
So I'm challenging you to think about this from the district lens one more time again. Sometimes we get a parent or certain parents and we are, and that's a great step. We didn't always have that family voice there. Um, but some things I've noticed in districts is we kind of tend to have the same families that contribute. So if we're talk, truly talking about equity, let's challenge ourselves to make sure that even if we divide the district in quadrants, and we make sure we have someone representing each quadrant. Um, and are we ensuring equitable supports for families and community partnerships across the district? You know, many times we have a strong community partner and it might be a library that's in one section, but we know transportation might be an issue. So how do we make sure that service and support just doesn't happen at a place, that it's not dependent on that, but that it truly goes to the people that need those support and services? So how do we facilitate conversations with our community partners and ensure we're getting the services um, where they need to go rather than requiring people to come to a place to receive those things. So finally, I mentioned Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement. And again, I want to remind you that family engagement and community collaboration are two of the five which is really significant. So in Ohio's plan, it very explicitly spells out that if the Ohio Department of Ed Education, excuse me, or in this case, I'm gonna ask you to substitute wherever you are, or the SST, the ESC, the district, the building, the classroom, um, the library, um, public transportation. If we promote continuous family engagement and family partnerships to support language and literacy development, then families will be better equipped, more engaged partners in their children's language and literacy development. And as I continue to do this work with families, I just get so excited. Um, because we have, I think what makes us come alive as teachers and we all have that heart is that aha moment and that realization. And as I continue to work with families, I get to see that moment of realization of, I didn't really know what I was doing mattered that much. So whether it's talking about serve and return interactions or pausing during a story to ask a question or some feedback I've gotten from families is, I didn't even know I could change my voice until I heard you read a story. My parents didn't really read to me growing up. I remember my teacher reading to me, but you know, it wasn't, she didn't really change her voice between characters, you know, I don't really have that memory of that. Um, and those are really powerful opportunities that we have. So again, we want you to use this tool to kind of facilitate those conversations. And finally, if the Ohio Department of Education or any of us as partners coordinate local community partnerships among agencies that provide services to learners to support language and literacy development, then more learners will experience language-rich literacy-based opportunities outside of school. So one example of this is just thinking about how you might host something outside of a school building because you know a barrier for a family might be that they didn't have a great school experience and it might be really threatening for them to walk in a school building. So how do you host and provide opportunities that maybe um, don't, comp don't compromise the content of what you're gonna share but really help people access that in a context that makes them feel more comfortable and able to engage. Okay. All right. If you're working at the building level, you might use some areas of this rubric to um, engage in shared leadership teams where you already are. So taking their data points as they work through their BLT, their building leadership team, um, or their TBT five-step process, and they're really looking at that curriculum-based measure data, how you can facilitate some of these questions to support where they are. If you have a big um, if you're doing a curriculum based measure in January, um, which we know is, a, is an important mid year benchmark, you know, how do you kind of bring that to the conversation as a coach to say if this is our priority for the second half of the year moving forward, how do we communicate that with families and what are we going to do to provide that support so it's also happening at home. So whether it's around phonemic awareness or phonics or even providing text evidence right our kids are having trouble providing text evidence in third grade, you know what let's get that oral language piece in place first. And let's um, really put out those prompts and ask families to have those conversations at night and do that from the oral language side. And here at school, we're, we'll work on the written part of that. So it might be, you know, tell me what made you laugh today and why, and give that specific example. Not just did something make you laugh today, yes or no, talk about it and give evidence why. Um, those are all very important connecting pieces. 
All right, if you're working through a school-wide reading plan development, again, very important to ask how you can partner with families and communities. Um, and then partnerships for literacy. Um, all of your state support team regions have a partnerships for literacy coach that can help walk through this process. Um, what we do in partnerships for literacy is we talk and work with school teams and we do a little bit of conversation around what you're already doing in engaging families. Um, and then talk about ways that we can universally design experiences. And then we walk school teams through bringing families around the table um, and what that looks like to really engage families as partners and make sure that they have a voice at the table and can provide that feedback and be critical decision makers in the process. Um, and then we also have a partnerships for literacy inventory that we work through with families. So I just wanna make sure that you all are aware of that. Um, Again, no matter what role you play, um, there are 16 SST state support team regions in Ohio, and all of your state support teams have a Partnerships for Literacy coach. Um, they all also have a regional early literacy specialist, which is what my role is, so you can reach out um, to them directly and they can help guide you to some of these supports or they all know how to get a hold of me um, so we, we can share that responsibility um, and making sure you have what you need and you also all have um, family engagement consultants as well that can support you in this work okay all right so it's time to kind of have a bit of a of a community conversation and what i'm saying is i'm like giving um kind of taking some scaffolds here. Um, it doesn't have to be a community conversation. It can be a conversation within yourself is what I'm saying. But based on our time together today, um, what next step are you gonna take to nurture the relationship between family engagement and early literacy? Um, it might be a resource that you provide as a consultant or a coach. It might be an experience that you create. Um, it might be a piece of a tool or a resource that you go back and share in one of your networks. Again, I don't have the expectation that everybody takes this back to a team and works through the whole rubric. If you do, that's fantastic. But realistically, I know that that's probably not going to be um, how, that, how that plays out. So Denise, I see your question. Um, how is the inventory different from this rubric? So the inventory, um, the inventory that's part of Partnerships for Literacy um, is really written in a very family-friendly way, um, and it's really um, designed to engage as a whole um, school team that engages and gives parents the opportunity to provide feedback on what the school is doing. Our tool is really an internal school team's tool that's really meant to help that team reflect on their practices, again, those evidence-based practices in family engagement and early literacy, um, to reflect and truly align that with what they're doing in their other plans. So, you know, if you if you want to connect it to your one plan, you know, again, your building plan, and that could be literacy and climate and culture. So again, um, our tool is more internal school team um, and the Partnerships for Literacy rubric is a way to engage families in the conversation together. And I'm just going to proactively, we have a very diverse audience today, so I apologize. I did my best to give specifics because I know we have a lot of coaches and consultants who, who are really, really deeply embedded in this work. Um, but I also know that we have people who are just looking for overall general um, connections between um, early literacy and family engagement. So I tried to kind of do my best to, <laughs> to skate between both ends. So please, your questions are so valuable and it'll help us all learn. So if you have something more specific, I'm happy to share or you'd like examples. Um, and if not, I'm, I'm happy to again, take it to that 30,000 foot view as well. So I know I'll just chat. I'll just keep chatting if that's helpful. <laughs> um, so I know um, a lot of our districts are really working on, this is just a little coaching scaffold I gave to one district in one conversation. <laughs> and it's really taken off and made really, really um, 
it's just helped them to kind of universally design their family engagement a little bit better. So a lot of us around the state um, use the um, Hegarty phonemic awareness curriculum. Um, we love it. We, you know, we don't like to endorse certain programs per se, but we love it because it's a great curriculum supplement. Um, and we know that phonemic awareness is just really um, the most powerful determinant um, in learning how to read. And we know that a lot of our adult learners also um, still, still need support in phonemic awareness. Um, so we were talking about, we had a really, really big focus on Hegarty, the adult implementation of it. Um, our teams were doing walkthroughs to ensure that, you know, everybody was prioritizing and was really um, implementing with fidelity. Um, so we were in a meeting and we were talking about that. And then I felt like we totally switched to our climate and culture goal when we started to talk about, you know, attendance and, you know, about how much time, instructional time our children miss sometimes and what do we do? And so thankfully we all a lot of times have the opportunity to be the people that are kind of an external layer. Um, I miss that the most probably about being in the classroom and being in a building is that, you know, elbow to elbow, getting dirty, hard work every day. Um, but the other blessing of being in a role like this is sometimes you just get to be that fresh pair of eyes that helps to people make connections when, you know, you're not so deep in the work. Um, and I use this example a lot, but it was really helpful for them is that, you know, if you're prioritizing Haggerty in the building, and you're really trying to proactively work on attendance and engaging your families in a positive way, you know, when you have a child that's absent, you know, maybe send them through your Remind app a video of the Hegarty lesson from the day and just say to the family really quickly, hey, we really missed Landon today and we're so sorry to hear that he's sick. Maybe while you're snuggling on the couch, you all can sit together and watch the lesson today and we hope we hope you're back tomorrow. You know, so you're, you're kind of taking those evidence-based practices again in family engagement and in, um, language and literacy and marrying the two together. So, you know, you presume positive intent, you know, you're making a positive contact with the family. It's not the three days later absent postcard, you know, that we sometimes do, but it's just that really quick, like, hey, we missed you. We recognize you're not here. And so not only is the child still having an opportunity to access that instruction, but the parents are seeing that great modeling as well, because we know that's what we want to get to, right? Um, we want those short videos that help families to take those practices and embed them in their daily routine. So, you know, my dream is that we're talking about, you know, we have families walking around that are doing bedtime, bedtime, and bath time, bath time. And um, so there's just lots of exciting opportunities that we have. And again, we all know that embedding in our routines with the materials and resources we have is the way to go. So um, I know I'm more likely to stick with a new, um, a new diet plan or an exercise routine, right? If I can get the ingredients I need that at the grocery store that's right down the street from me. <laughs> Or if it's a workout that I can do at home or I can do outside that I don't need stuff for, I don't need to go to a place for, um, we need to take that same idea, you know, it's, it doesn't mean we make an excuse and we don't do it, but it means we take what we know works and we find a way um, to make it fit in our lives. So that's um, the opportunity that we all have, no matter what role we play. Oh, I love that. I know. As parents, right, you do miss those videos with your kids. And I, I'm so glad you made that point, Andrea, because it did. you do them a lot during COVID and they dropped off during this school year. And I'll be honest, I had this exact conversation with my instructional coaching network yesterday because we have some instructional coaches in place that are fantastic and so knowledgeable, but they're struggling with the amount that's on teachers' plates right now and you know, engaging them in full coaching cycles. So we're talking about all of the ways that they can partner to provide those supports and partner with their TBTs. So you know, maybe again, it's not, it's always working smarter, not harder, um, you know, and maybe that it's not always, you know, individual teachers that need to do these videos, but is there a coach that can do that? Um, you know, can each teacher, you know, take a day of the week and do it, you know, and how fun is it sometimes for kids to see other teachers, you know, we, 
we as teachers didn't, don't always get to see what's happening in other teachers' classrooms, you know? And so kids love to see other, other people's teachers sometimes. And when you're doing something with fidelity that you know you're all doing the same thing, like Hegarty or Star, that's a really great place to start. So I wanna make sure I caught everybody in the chat. I warned y'all up front that I really just want this to be a big conversation. So I hope that I hope that you somewhat felt like I wasn't totally married to the slideshow. But if I were sitting at Starbucks with you around a table, this is kind of the same conversation that we would be having. Okay, Rochelle, I'm gonna check. We are working on a pilot program. Increasing early literacy. Oh, great. I'm so glad that it'll be helpful. Again, I my heart was really that it wasn't something you felt pressured to take this whole rubric and work through all six areas. I know I'm somebody who thinks I have to be that four like yesterday. <laughs> so um, yes. Um, okay. More family nights. You did virtual events. Ooh, literacy activities for grades four to six families. We did try to work that in there, Jen. Um, but yes, we can absolutely do that. I, I would stick with, this is just my off the cuff response to that. What we're finding our data saying is writing is a challenge. And so I've really challenged my teachers at that third and fourth grade level is what you're expecting children to do in writing. And I hate to say on the test because that's not what we're teaching towards, but I always work to partner with families to say whatever I'm asking them to do, how can those, how can I partner to find out that that can happen from the oral language side of things? So if you go to Ohio's plan and you look at the simple view of reading, um, I would encourage you to do that. It's really, really important um, that we not, we don't just think about language comprehension is that, um, as that written piece, but also that oral language piece as well. So in my mind, I am constantly, constantly working towards that oral language piece, even as children get older. And I think it's one of the biggest things we can combat um, screen time and technology with. We don't have time to get into that whole aspect of things today. Um, I wish we did in another presentation. Um, but again, that's something really doable and important. And if families really, again, we all value education. If we can help them maximize talk time with their child um, with our um, language and literacy goals, then that's a big win as far as I'm concerned. Okay, Patrick, did I miss anything? It's a question about sharing your contact information. Um, so I don't know, we can, we can maybe drop that in the chat. Sure, we can do that, Andrea. And I also, um, again, want to encourage, we are part of a fantastic state system of support. And um, in every state support team region, you have a regional early literacy specialist, which is the role that I play. And I also um, did a lot of family engagement and community collaboration work before I took this role officially. So I had that language and literacy love from the classroom, um, but I also really um, love working with families and community partners. So I really would encourage you um, to reach out to your own state support team members as much as possible. Um, again, the regional early literacy specialist, and you all have um, a consultant who's a member of the Family and Community Engagement Network, which is where um, this rubric really um, was born from. Um, my email is there. You are welcome to contact me, and I would be happy to um, connect you with the right person in your region or provide whatever support you need, but I'm just really grateful that we're having this conversation as a state. Um, and that we really are just working together to support our children um, by also supporting our families and our communities as well, because we, we all have a role to play. So um, thank you so much. And I'll hang on for a couple more minutes um, as well if we have any questions come up. But um, just again, thanks to our work group. This was a group effort. Um, it just came out of a need to like, what does it really look like to bring these two, these two things together and to leverage the great work that's already happening in our schools? Thank you, Jen, uh, for sharing your time with us today. Um, and I see a, a lot of people are already doing this, but please join me in thanking her in the chat. Um, so it's almost 11 15 um, there's going to be a little about a 15 minute break the next session will begin at 11 30. Um, so again I, I wrote this in the chat but if this is your final session for the day um, please be sure to take our survey and the link is in the chat currently um, and we ask you only take the survey once so just make sure you take it 
at the end during your final session of the day. Um, and also please uh, remember to keep the conversation going on Twitter and you can use the hashtag chart new territories and also visit our website, which is ohiofamiliesengaged.osu.edu slash summit. And that has information for all of the events today. Um, but again, Jen, thank you so much. This is really, really great. Um, and feel free to reach out for more questions or, or let you can let me know specifically too if you have questions about the rest of the day. Thank you, Patrick.